If this is the talk you came to see, then you're in the right spot, so welcome. <laughs> um, do you guys want me to use the microphone, or can everyone hear me okay in the back? Use the microphone? All right, I'll try to use this one as well today. Does that work better for you guys? Okay, um, so welcome. This is the Radio Direction Finding Networks talk. Um, and we'll give you a little plug. I've got another talk this afternoon on uh, uh, communication support for the world's largest triathlon. So if you're interested, this room as well at 1 o'clock. Um, if you like what I'm talking about, it'll be a different topic. So, um, so a little bit about myself. That's me. Uh, my name is Marcel, AI6MS. I was licensed Cinco de Mayo 2008 with John over in the yellow fleecy over there. Um, and you'll notice a number of folks wearing these red Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club shirts. That's us. Um, we uh, rebuilt that club in the last couple of years, and now we're one of the largest, uh, the nation's largest collegiate amateur radio clubs, which is kind of fun. Uh, some of my hobbies include uh, APRS, Automatic Position Reporting System, or Packet, depending on who you ask, and uh, ARDF as well, Amateur Radio Direction Finding. How many APRS and tea hunting aficionados do we have in the room? Yeah. Good hand hunt. Okay. I figured you might be able to talk. <laughs> Um, I'm currently an electrical engineering graduate student. I also did my undergrad at Cal Poly, um, and I'm hopefully graduating this quarter. My thesis advisor is sitting up in the front corner, Dr. Clark this Turner. This is good. W3JPG. So this is, you know, <laughs> if all goes well, we could. So um, as you can imagine, being a master's student, uh, my thesis is covering radio direction findings. So hopefully that will give you some interesting points, and uh, we'll definitely talk more about that. So a quick overview for today, what we're going to be covering. Um, what is radio direction finding? So we'll give a little bit of history on that, some of the existing technologies that are out there, um, some that are commercially available, others that you can't go out and just buy, and uh, then talk about specifically what I'm more focusing on is this radio direction finding network. So an actual network of these direction finding units to better locate things. So why might we want them? What are they good for doing? Um, what already is out there? And talk about some of those networks that already exist and how they're being used. Then we'll look at two case studies, uh, one that I worked on earlier this year uh, on a pseudo-Doppler technique, um, which is a phased antenna array that is used to um, find the direction of a signal source. And then we'll talk about a UT or uplink time difference of arrival and how that's used in uh, direction finding as well. So that's what I'm working on in, in this quarter specifically. And then we'll touch on a couple of future developments, some of which already exist, some of which are not commercially implemented and some of our friends in some of the government labs might be able to tell us less about that. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we'll start off with uh, what is radio direction finding? How many here have heard of radio direction finding before? That's a great sign. Okay. <laughs> so in the very basic sense, we're locating RF signal sources. So you want to know where a transmitter is coming from. Uh, some things that might want that. Uh, emergency service might like to know where 911 caller is coming from. Uh, in search and rescue, it might be nice to know where the party that you're searching and trying to rescue is. Um, in the military, knowing where your jammers are at, knowing where your own units are at. Um, and commercial applications, uh, asset tracking is very nice, knowing where your people and your trucks are, that sort of thing. And of course in uh, navigation for aeronautical and marine, they use uh, a lot of radio navigation. Some of you VORs and LORAN and that sort of thing um, is using the same concept of radio direction finding. So in the very simplified form, they're kind of two-step process. One, you're going to receive some sort of signal and characterize it in one way or shape or form. So a number of ways you can characterize a signal that can be used for direction finding or locating it would be signal strength, so how strong that signal is. If it's closer to you, obviously it's going to be stronger. If it's farther away, it's going to be weaker. And there are thousands of formulas for figuring that out. Um, and uh, the actual direction that that signal approaches you from, which in the best case comes directly from where it came from, and the worst case comes from the opposite direction where it came from, bouncing off the room around you and coming back from behind. Um, those strange voices you hear when you go into the bathroom at night, it could just be you know, different paths of arrival, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, and time of arrival, which is one I'll touch on quite a bit more later. Um, but time of arrival specifically, what actual time that signal shows up. Um, radio waves are not instantaneous, as you can imagine. They travel at more or less the speed of light, so that can give us some pretty interesting information as well. Second step of this process is to actually gather this data and do something with it, so calculate most probable locations based off of that data. With a single receive site that has signal strength, you could tell within a nice radius of that receive site where some signal might be, but not much else. 
So that's where we start getting into the networking. So a quick touch on a little bit of history. Um, anyone here work on any of these devices? There's always one in the crowd, great. <laughs> so uh, on the bottom left here is known as an elephant cage. It's a high frequency direction finding, direction finding system used in World War II. Um, and I'm sure you could chat with Harry afterwards and he'll happily tell you a lot more about it as well. But there was one at Skaggs Island up until about 10 years ago. Up at Skaggs Island they had one, yeah. Yeah, they're dismantling the last one and we'll be on one now. Okay, so they're, they're disappearing fast, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, one of our professors at Kapolei as well worked on those. Um, pretty much it's a huge array of antennas, and they actually have pretty good accuracy down to potentially half a degree of directionality for high-frequency signals used primarily for um, looking for enemies. So uh, with multiple of these sites around that all then reported in a different heading, someone back at the command base could say, hey, that's where that submarine is, maybe we should go send out some planes to go take a look at that. Um, on the bottom right, uh, that's an ad hoc uh, time of difference of arrival um, direction finding station as well. Uh, the other one to touch on is the National Distress and Response System from the United States Coast Guard. And I'll uh, touch into their updated system as that as well, but that's from the 70s. So this is kind of the older um, direction finding. It's been around for years. Um, radio direction finding, obviously, not quite as hundreds of years old, but regular direction finding, sure. Okay, so what else exists? So Civil Air Patrol, if anyone, anyone here in Civil Air Patrol? A couple folks, okay. Um, so aircraft emergency locating transponders, um, they send out a little blip when an aircraft crashes somewhere, and uh, the older systems all had a 121.5 beacon on them, low power AM signal that you could direction find um, using various systems. So directional antennas usually, um, when you're flying in a plane, you fly around, locate it, come down, and then try to find it. Um, in search and rescue personal locating beacons, um, various forms of that. Project Lifesaver is a great example. Um, Alzheimer's patients will often carry a little 50 milliwatt transmitter that stays on for a month. And if they ever run away from home or anything, teams that are working closely with the Sheriff's Department can then go find those people um, where they might have wandered off, not knowing. Uh, research likes using it for animal tracking. The California Condor Project at Pinnacles National Monument is one of my favorite examples. They drive around in their cars with a single antenna until they can hear a condor beacon. And then they run out with antennas set up similar to the tape measure Yangi that we're so familiar with um, and actually find where the condor is, can tag it, get information for what they're doing. And then for amateur radio, of course, how many here have been on a tea hunt of some sort? Mostly proud, okay. Um, so for amateur radio direction finding, that's just out of the hobby. Why do we really do it? Well, to play with gear, but besides that, um, jammers and interference is a great one. So I was just telling a brief story earlier. At Cal Poly, we had a huge issue with one of our repeaters that we had a big intermodulation um, interference product problem where we had to go hunt that down. And that was a two weeks or so of DFing, and we found a, a number of sources. But it uh, makes it more challenging that way. Okay, so an RDF network specifically. So radio direction finding network is when you have multiple receive sites and then that gives you a lot more data than just the one we talked about. Just the one earlier that's just giving you signal strength doesn't do very well. But now if you suddenly have 20 different stations throughout, let's say, Silicon Valley, and some of them are giving you a very strong signal and others aren't giving you a signal at all, that can give you a very good geographic locating um, for where that signal actually is. I can answer the phone if you like to. <laughs> um, so the nice thing about this is you have system level locating capabilities. If you're moving that information data to a central resource, then you can do a lot more with it as well. And we'll get some of that at the very end of this presentation with additional processing that you can do um, with more. So one of the existing systems out there is the LoJack vehicle tracking system. How many here are familiar with LoJack or have worked with it? Mm -hmm. Okay, most. So it's, um, it's vehicle tracking, so you can buy this thing for your car. It's a little trans, uh, transponder that, or transceiver that sits in your car and uh, sits on receive indefinitely until um, you report it stolen. They send out a little satellite blip that says, hey, I want you to start transmitting. And then magically your car will start beaconing out where it is. Um, if you're lucky enough that your local police station was in, uh, equipped with this system, then you'll notice the cop cars that drive around with the four antennas on their roof, and they've got this nice little low jack um, head unit that sits in their car, and it beeps out and says, hey, I just found a signal of a stolen car. It gives you the identifier, you can radio it into your dispatch, and then go drive around. They're using a pseudo Doppler receive unit for that, and as they drive closer, it will give them a little heading. You can see the little thing right here. That'll give them a nice little heading of where that car is. So as they drive around, it'll point to it, and then they can find the vehicle's description based off what dispatch told them, 
arrest the guy, and you know the rest is history. Hopefully, uh, ninety percent success rate, and it's in several million cards already, and has been used quite a bit. So it's a pretty impressive system. Um, the other one is Coast Guard Rescue Twenty One. This is the upgraded National um, Response and Distress System. Um, it monitors the emergency channels for the Marine system, um, the Marine radio systems, and based on a number of receive sites around the coastal regions of the United States. Anytime one of those stations receives a call on channel 16, it would be able to immediately locate, roughly, it's only at that receive site or if multiple sites are hearing it, it gives you an idea of where along the coast that signal is coming from. Um, if you're lucky enough to have digital selective calling enabled as well, um, or anything else along those lines, they actually have transmitters in the boats that can transmit out their GPS location and their vessel's information, number of occupants on board, who it's registered to, description, all that, so that when Coast Guard's responding, it's a lot easier to find that yacht in the a marina that was accidentally turned on their DSC. So, <laughs> um, if any of you are familiar with, well, at ELTs for aircraft, it's upper, upwards in the 95, if not higher, percentage of false um, false setups. So, my dad's in the Civil Air Patrol, and yeah, they go on a lot of searches and they end up at the hangar at the local air, air base. So, it's always fun. So, uh, the Coast Guard system does have some direction finding built in as well, depending on the sites that are implemented. Um, there's unfortunately not a lot of public info um, on that. So. Okay, the other one that's now pretty relevant to what I'm working on is uh, this E901 Phase 2 uh, system. So this is using a time difference of arrival system. Um, for cellular networks, one of the biggest things was landlines back in the days. We also have landlines, I hope. Um, those could tell you really quickly where that person was because landline was assigned to a house and at the dispatch um, or the telephone network, they could tell you right away where that person was. For uh, cell, cell phones, a cell phone could be anywhere in the greater United States or in the world even, so you'd have to know where that was. Um, it made it somehow into the telephone network and you had a phone number, but even the area code nowadays on someone's cell phone doesn't tell you where they actually live. So getting more information was critical. So the FCC actually mandated that um, cell phone companies require to report position anytime you do a 911 call. Um, the second phase of which is actually quite good. Um, uses what's known as UTDOA, so uplink time difference of arrival, and they're required within six minutes of a 911 call to report within a 300 meter accuracy to um, the 911 database where it is. A number of people were fined when another number of cell phone companies were fined when they weren't able to meet that. Um, I think that was in 2006, um, but that's theoretically what they should be able to do. So commercially, this exists. Um, they also use a number of other methods besides just UTOA, um, AOA angle of arrival. So by um, cell phone towers have a number of antennas on them, so based on which antenna is actually receiving it, that gives them a basic direction. Um, and if you have a number of cell sites that are receiving it in a metropolitan area, you can get a better locating um, region as well. Um, a GPS, assisted GPS, um, if the cell phone has GPS on it, this is something they did try, but since not all cell phones have GPS, having a cell phone report where it is itself was a nice idea, um, but harder to implement. Uh, and one of the more fascinating ones, I'll touch on this a little later, as well as location signature. Just based on the quality of the RF signal, um, you can know where it came from based on the characteristics when it's traveling through space. Question? Yeah, uh, rural areas where you might only have one cell site that's picking up the signal. So right. The so in rural areas, you'd hope that the local fire department knows the name of the person who's calling and where they live. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's definitely an issue. So um, I'm sure there were the FCC had some <laughs> change rules for certain areas. Um, so with this sort of network, it's tower-based receive sites. So there are a number of huge existing multi-trillion dollar infrastructure that's sitting out there that has, um, often they have to add on some special receivers to those sites to better get this information. Um, but then that processing is all network-based. So those towers send that information back to some headquarters sitting somewhere, some computer crunches some numbers, and then automatically spits that up to the local 911 center. That's all fine and dandy, but uh, kind of expensive if you want to implement it in not this region. All right, so a quick overview of those. So satellite, uh, the ELT system is initially satellite based. They pick it up and people go out where you hear it locally. Um, also expensive, but uh, nicely done. Low jack, digital system, uh, very high cost, and they had to go around and pay a bunch of police departments to put this stuff in their um, cars. Uh, Coast Guard Rescue 21. Uh, also a fixed network, also very high cost, not something that a lot of agencies can afford, unless you're the Coast Guard. 
Um, and then E911, again, high cost. The nice thing is it was on an existing network, so they don't have to go out and build a bunch of cell phone towers to know where the cell phones are, because obviously the towers were there anyway. So what's missing from all this? Uh, some low cost deployable RDF network that public service emergency response can use nicely. Uh, why might they want that? Uh, asset tracking, search and rescue specifically, finding jammers and natural disasters. So what does that mean? Uh, let's have a forest fire, for example, and you're sending out all your firefighters out to the forest. Okay, you could give them all little spot messenger beacons and hope that they don't die. Or you could just send them out as is, and anytime they transmit on their radio and send out an RF signal, you have a network of these little low-cost deployable things that receive and can tell you exactly where every firefighter is. Um, sounds like a pretty neat idea and something that's not out there. So that's kind of the niche that I was focusing on for my thesis specifically, is some low-cost, small, relatively dependable system that you can deploy um, and use for that. Feel free to interrupt with questions as well. I mentioned that. Yeah? The FCC's uh, RDF? Yeah, I didn't put that a slide in for that, but... What, what are the, Sorry? The time of arrival system? Which one? The FCC's RDF. For the cell networks or the... No, no, HF3. Oh, they're HF1. I'm not... I haven't done up good numbers on that, sorry. Okay, so implementation overview for the specific system. I'm, I'm developing um, small, portable, low-cost, replaceable and fault tolerance. So if you lose one node in the network, it's not a big deal. Um, but you can, it's low-cost enough that you can deploy a lot of nodes. Uh, easy to build, use and operate, which comes largely from making it cost so commercial off the shelf. Something that your everyday person, if I post my, when I, my thesis gets posted, someone can look it up and say, hey, I'd like to build a system of this um, really cheaply. You know, if I, there's going to be some code that they're going to have to throw into whatever microcontroller they want to use. And it should be easily, easily deployable. So minimizing the complexity of that system um, and maximizing the searchability. So if any one component fails, you just go online and buy another one and replace it. So it's not like you have to build extensive custom hardware um, and it starts getting really difficult to work with. Uh, one of the things as a ham radio operator that really intrigued me is existing this with, um, oh, sorry, integrating this with existing infrastructure. So uh, APRS, as you well know, is a very widespread system that at least in rural areas is um, pretty extensive. So if you have these receive sites um, linking with that network, it works quite well. There's actually some existing stuff ready in the APRS um, packet pro uh, handling that allows for RDF as well. So you can send out a specific packet that gives you know, direction or signal strength, and then certain programs will handle that and plot it out for you nicely. So you can already, at least on an amateur scale, pull that stuff out quite quickly, which is very nice. So the first case study we're going to look at is what's known as a pseudo-Doppler pseudo technique. How many folks here are familiar with that already or have heard the term? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So uh, in the simplest sense, this is the same thing that LoJack's using. Uh, you have four antennas that are in an array with less than a quarter wavelength spacing between the antennas, and you electronically switch between them. Now to conceptualize this, we kind of need to think about how this actually works. So if you think about a siren driving past you as it gets closer, of course, as the frequency increases, and they drive past you, it decreases just from their relative speeds. So if you take an antenna and you start moving it towards another source, you would expect the frequency of that source to seem higher to you, right? As you move that antenna away from the source, that frequency is going to decrease as well. So now if you take that antenna and you start spinning around in a circle really quick, you should be able to discern based on where the frequency peaks and where it nulls, gives you two points that you can draw a line through and find out where that signal is coming from. Great in theory, except spinning an antenna at 20,000 RPM is a little bit expensive and has a lot of mechanical failure points. So this is where they started getting to the electronic switching. So from the previous slide, you'll notice that they all have these switching control boxes that then actually um, spin those antennas around electronically. So you electronically switch through any number of antennas. Four is kind of the minimum standard that most people use. You can use a lot more. If you remember that very first slide, the high-frequency DFing station, that has anywhere from 30 to 100 of those um, antennas, if not more, with a huge capacity coupled um, switcher in the inside that just spins around. Um, so they're doing the same thing, just on a much larger and obviously more expensive scale as well. So the useful thing with this sort of Doppler network is that you actually have directional headings, right? So if you sit down on Napier's map and plot this, on the right we have three um, sources or receive sites that are each getting a heading, and in the ideal situation those lines intersect beautifully in one little spot, and you send out your team right there, and that's where your source is. 
So if you have a jammer in Santa Barbara, then you can send them out right there. Um, so I built one of these um, earlier this year, and it was based off the WA2EBY design from QST in 1999. A very good article, it's one that's referenced by a number of other folks. Uh, in the basic setup, you have your antenna switcher on the left, um, and then you have a bunch of processing junk, an FM receiver, and then a compass display that pretty much tells you where this is coming from. Um, this is available on the digital archives from QST as well, so you can look at that. So for the first portion, um, one of the more, more challenging parts of this from a construction perspective is the antenna switcher. And there are commercial antenna switchers available, but they're all made by small ham companies and they're not very available and they're expensive. So that kind of made it difficult for this project. So from, if you think back to that small, low cost, portable, deployable network, I was trying to find a way to make this small, portable, low cost and practical for people. So I took the design that he had for the antenna switcher and tried to simplify it down to the smallest amount of components possible throw it on a single-sided copper clad board, uh, etched out with a Dremel tool, it works great by the way. And then you can throw service mount components which are usually um, findable or of course the roll components work just fine. Didn't happen to have those resistors as surface mounts so we just threw some through holes on there. Um, switch from a single diode system to, or from a twin diode per antenna to um, one diode per antenna. And this worked really well. Our um, isolation was great and it switched between the antennas beautifully when I actually tested it. Uh, to quickly describe functionally how it works, um, diodes obviously conduct when they're biased one way and not the other way. So what you do is you send a biasing current to each of these antennas in sequence, um, which then activates that cable per se, so it all switches, and that's diode switching. Um, it's based on the direction of the diodes, and you have to throw some decoupling in there so you don't have RF going all over the place, and then you don't throw DC bias in other areas. So some decoupling capacitors here in the middle, um, and then uh, your inductor here as well for your DC lines to decouple the RF. Uh, in this case, you can see the topology. You've got four antennas around the, each side of the board, and then that's our main feed that would go to the receiver. So your receiver would then receive the signal coming from these four antennas. Okay, so in practice, we throw four mag mounts on the roof because mag mounts are meeting our requirements for commercial off the shelf and cheap and easily deployable. Granted, you need a nice metal surface to throw it on. The roof of the car works great, but not so great if you want to leave it on some remote site. So in that case, you might, you know, cookie sheet or something else that starts becoming more feasible. Um, on the right here, that's the actual setup attached. But you notice it's not, we started running into some of the issues that I ran into with this as well. It's becoming less and less commercial, easy to build, serviceable for um, non-technical hams like yourselves. So, uh, the next portion that I wanted to address is this whole right section of the receiver design. So this is the entire data processing of everything. When you get the signal, you have to send a signal out to the antenna switcher, and then from the antenna switcher, you get your signal to the FM receiver, which then sends you audio. And based off of that audio, which is changing frequency, right, because there's a frequency modulation, and we're increasing or decreasing the frequency, that switching the antennas actually shows up as a tone on the FM demodulated signal. So when we get the audio frequency coming back in, we can hear that tone on the audio frequency, and based on the changing tone um, nature of that, we can actually get a direction when we time sync it with the actual selection of those antennas. Okay, so the critical thing here is that the switching signal that you're sending out to your antenna um, is beautifully matched and calibrated with your audio frequency that's coming back in. So this whole section on the right, there's a discrete component implementation of it in the QST article, which has Ooh, I don't know, 50 or 150 parts to it, um, which is, for most of the folks in this room, probably quite feasible. If it's something, again, low-cost, deployable, easily serviceable, maintainable, it becomes a little bit more challenging. You accidentally shorted that one component somewhere, and they don't have the skills to debug it. So um, another one of those limitations. So what I did is I replaced this whole thing with a very common microcontroller, the Arduino Uno, which many people here might be familiar with. And from a very simple perspective, at least initially, we just did um, switching signals. So switching signals just send out um, phase lock, pretty straightforward in Arduino. You just turn four I.O. pins on, turn one on, wait, turn the other one on, turn the first one off, turn the next one on, turn the next one on, and just go through. So you can see here the cycling, the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, back to the first one. And that gets you sequentially through your antennas switching through. So then really nicely with either an external potentiometer or just changing the code, you can adjust the frequency of that to something that works well for your setup. So we use this switching, picked 500 hertz, because that's a pretty common one that folks are using for RDF. 
And for testing purposes, um, we're able to use this software called Sound Doppler from PA3 BNX, which is a pretty simple uh, sound card based Doppler direction finding system. So uh, it takes those two signals in. So one would be the switching frequency from the Arduino, and the other one would be the actual tone that you're receiving from your FM radio. So if you notice my um, beautiful high tech test up, setup here, the mushroom box from Costco, um, we have our antenna switcher here with a bunch of coax going up to the antennas on the roof. We've got our Arduino, some line level adapters to make everything happy so we don't blow up our computer. Uh, a Yesu VX5R, which is receiving the signal from the antenna switcher. The audio which is being fed into the audio jack of the computer, which is running the sound Doppler software. So, drive around the neighborhood a little bit and start receiving some local stations. This is the um, airport uh, ADA system, which is just giving us information. So the sound Doppler system is actually surprisingly good. Um, the software that he has will um, listen to the audio coming in, and you can adjust some offsets and everything. There's this calibration here for the zero crossing. And then based on the signal coming in, it crosses the uh, normalized axis at some point where you'd have that tone give you the nice direction. So then it plots out and says, oh, this was minus 230 degrees from your current heading. Okay, so um, or the orientation of that. So if you're driving around the neighborhood, there are some limitations to the software because it doesn't account for you taking turns. So that heading is always with respect to your car, of course, which is actually kind of a nice thing. So as you're driving around, it would be in the back left direction would be where that signal is coming from, if you had it calibrated with the north going forward. How accurate was it? <laughs> We're getting to that. <laughs> so some of the successes from this, uh, this digital switching implementation was great, really easy to do, something that's a lot more modern, kind of has a nicer appeal to um, folks nowadays that want to build something not from through old components and old, component, uh, old parts that are a little hard to find. Fortunately, HSC carried most of the parts I needed, so I was able to build up the discrete version, but um, it's a little more complex than most people would like just for an easy weekend project. Uh, the antenna array group of concept worked really well. The switching control board, yeah, was simple, but it still required some technical skill to pull off. Um, and the nice thing about Doppler is there are a number of systems out there. So there's this test software that could use to test it. Um, there are a number of commercial available ones you can actually go out and buy from some ham companies. Um, but it did have a number of drawbacks as well. So the accuracy and calibration, this is one of the questions from Phil. Um, the actual heading accuracy is very dependent on your system setup and uh, very susceptible to multipath as well. So if you start having um, the signal coming at you from multiple directions, it starts getting really confused. It'll jump all over the place and won't give you a steady reading. If you read any of the books, um, Joe Wells' Radio Direction Finding Hunting book, he covers a lot of that very in depth when you're driving around with a Doppler system. It's critical to not take each point individually, but rather with your eyes take a statistical sam sampling of where it's pointing you to and say, okay, this is roughly where it's like trending to come from, and that's the direction you want to come. So that becomes an issue if we're setting these up as remote sites as well, because we'd either need to send a lot of data and send out a ton of data points, or we'd need to trust the accuracy of a single receive point. So if your jammer signal is not very long, or if someone's sending out a distress call and it's pretty short, um, the signal strength and the duration of that signal might not be there to get enough samples to get good accuracy as well. Where the receiver is actually located becomes an issue. Um, when you start moving up into mountaintops, you have to make sure that the down tilt of your antennas can receive into the valleys that you're near as well. Um, if you're near buildings, you set up in the corner of this room, you'll get ridiculous results because things are just bouncing off the walls. Um, same thing becomes in an urban environment, it becomes very challenging to use this system. Um, so, any folks here have a Doppler system on their car for direction finding? A couple? Okay. I'd be curious to chat with you afterwards as well from some of your experiences. So some of the other issues, uh, the custom hardware of course is a, a, a big issue for the specific scope of this project. Um, the large antenna array, you've got four antennas that you need to have for a VHF system It's feasible. If you start going to high frequency it gets a little bit ridiculous. Um, I don't know if anyone has a six meter Doppler array on their car but I'm sure it exists out there. And that's yeah, based off of antenna sizing. Okay, so case study number two. So this is the one we talked about earlier, um, uplink time difference of arrival. So it's currently being used by the E911 phase two system with cellular networks. Um, and it's based on the fact that your signal takes a certain amount of time to travel through free space, right? So C equals lambda F, and you can 
based, based off of that, you can figure out you know, where your signal is coming. So with multiple different receive sites, each of them is beautifully time synced. So in the ideal theoretical world, if you have each of those systems set up, you'd be able to receive very accurately. Um, and you can find out where it is. And we'll get into that a little bit more shortly. Um, so the benefits of this system versus the Doppler system, specifically, is the receive hardware is greatly simplified. You have a single antenna, a single receiver, and then based on when that signal arrives at that receiver, with some frequent, uh, clock source that gives you a timestamp, you then just send that out and tell us. So your total system size is greatly reduced, and your power requirements are greatly reduced. Um, this is my ABRS setup, but that's separate. <laughs> so with the timing requirements, so the key factor to this whole time difference of arrival system is near timing accuracy. And if you can't pull off that timing accuracy, the system is useless. Okay, so if you just throw quartz crystals into each of the receive sites, and based off your standard stopwatch, what's the accuracy of a stopwatch? Oh, maybe a second over a day if you're lucky. Um, and as you can see, you need 333 nanoseconds for 100 meter accuracy, and accounting for perfect free space velocity in the vacuum, right? So you also need to calibrate in OK, you know, different temperatures and humidities, change your speed of light a little bit. Um, if you have cloud cover, that sort of thing, it starts getting a little bit more complicated. But from a simple sense, um, one of your nice clock sources is a GPS source. Um, sounds great in practice. Commercial timing servers that you can buy for um, IT networking, you can buy those, drop them in, put a special antenna on the roof that gets a really nice GPS signal. They give you sub 100 nanosecond commercial timing. Your typical consumer GPS, though, only gives you about a microsecond, which is roughly 300 meters accuracy. So 300 meters, depending on the implementation and what you're actually wanting to use this network for, is acceptable. So we started developing based off of a typical consumer GPS. Um, a calibration note as well. Uh, once, if you have good timing systems um, for each of these sites, then it becomes uh, pretty easy to actually calibrate your whole system. So if you have a number of sites that are set up, they're all time synced beautifully, you can set up known beacons at certain locations and transmit, and then you know how long the signal should take to get to each of your sites. So based on what the data they send you and say when they actually heard them, you can adjust your algorithms accordingly. So you can do something that's known as locational characterization, where you could have someone walk around with the GPS and transmit, and you could like use a dress or something, and then go through and walk off a grid pattern of the area that you want to cover and get very accurate time samples for the actual setup. That would include multipath, that would include all your other factors as well um, for that time and day with that temperature, all that sort of thing, right? <laughs> um, and that would reduce any system-based timing errors. Specifically, your receive sites, if you have longer cable lengths to your antennas at certain sites, that would change your time of arrival a little bit. Um, if, yeah, if it's sitting oddly and has some multipath off some other site, you might run into some issues. Yeah? With the uh, APRS? Mobile around. You potentially have that calibration all the time. Exactly. So if you used, you could use existing systems out there. So APRS, if you um, had them listen on the APRS frequency, you knew when people were beaconing and their GPS position you'd hope would be relatively accurate. You could use that for calibration for free. So yeah, absolutely. In an urban area environment, that would work mm -hmm. good. So the basic concept is you use a simple transceiver, you plug in a GPS to it, and have a some sort of microcontroller that then listens to your GPS for a time sync, um, listens to the transceiver for when it hears it, and when it does hear the two, it then beacons it out. For a low-cost COTS implementation that's already existing network, hey, the APRS network is great. So you can uh, beacon out and send out a packet, and then you receive it some station that would say, hey, I just heard you know, location XYZ transmit, uh, receive a signal at this signal strength at this location, and use that for um, then building up your map of where your signal is coming from, right? So we receive that signal, um, and your GPS only gives you updates once a second, um, usually from the commercial ones available. So you'd need to then run some sort of timer to actually find out from that timestamp that the GPS gave you how long until um, you heard the signal, or vice versa, from when you heard the signal to when the next stamp was. Send that information out along with any other information that you might have for it. So if you're, the transceiver you choose has an RSSI, Receive Signal Strength Indicator, you could transmit that as well, knowing what frequency it is on. If you have a frequency agile system and they're scanning around looking for different channels, um, 
and then of course where the receiver actually was located, which you hope we do to have documentation for. But if you have mobile receive sites as well, that might change. And that would all go back to some base station that would process all these packets and do something with them. Which characteristic of the transmission do you do you uh, oh. Great question. So there are a number of things that you can use for that. Um, for this implementation, I'm basing it off an audio um, arrival. So at the time where the receiver squelch actually opens, now that does cause issues, right? So based off of that transmitter, uh, when the receiver, you know, different squelch levels set on radios, all that sort of thing. In the ideal world, you use the oncoming phase of that signal. Um, so you go down to the baseband level, and when your receiver actually starts receiving a signal at that frequency, that would be what you um, characterize it off, and you can get much higher accuracy with that. From a basic implementation, yeah, it's a you know, cost-benefit analysis as well. What's a simple implementation versus a more complicated one? So we'll get into some other um, information things as well a little bit. So that's the basic idea of um, the time of arrival. So when you actually deploy this whole thing in a network then, um, ideally you'd keep your, uh, your individual unit cost is pretty low, um, around three to $400 per receive site, so you can start building up a network for a relatively low cost for um, a search and rescue team shelling out you know, a few thousand dollars at one point in their deployment cycle isn't too bad for the government to shell it out if in a natural disaster is dirt cheap. So um, you could hand place them on ridge lines, you could have them air dropped out of the C-130 over a fire zone and drop off a couple of these on ridge tops. Conceptually, um, kind of some of the limitations that might go out. Uh, of course, when you start running into more rural areas, you run out of APRS network because um, there are only so many received sites around um, and only so many digipeters that people have set up. So doing some sort of mesh networking for a future improvement as well would be critical that these sites can then talk to each other on some backhaul frequency, ideally. So we talk about some of the future developments then for this whole system. Um, one of them is radio transmitter fingerprinting. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, it's absolutely fascinating. I'd highly encourage you to go research it. Um, pretty much every single individual radio can be characterized based on its signal that it transmits. So the very beginning when the VCO locks and your um, initial frequency gets sent out from your radio, it has a certain characteristic waveform to it. It's not perfectly 146.52 megahertz, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 when it starts it has some sort of locking cycle. Different radio manufacturers are really easy to tell apart because they use different topology. Um, individual radios based on their component specifications and tolerances can actually be identified. Um, the Seattle Radio, uh, Seattle Repeater Group, I believe, SRG, um, has a repeater set up currently that receives signals um, from anyone mm -hmm. transmitting and then mm -hmm. at the end blips out a small um, data packet that says, hey, this is who, who transmitted, which is pretty impressive. So um, you can go research that. Seattle repeater group. That one was very interesting. One of the few um, amateur groups that I'm aware of that's implemented this. Uh, the government is known, I'm sure, to use this as well. Um, <laughs> it's something that's definitely out there. The other one I touched on briefly, environmental fingerprinting. Based on the characteristics of the signal that's arriving, you can know different things. So if you think of someone standing in front of a windmill and the windmill spinning, you'd have interesting fluttering pattern coming. Um, Think of it like that, but you know, if you're in a specific room and I transmit from this room, there's going to be a certain amount of bounce that goes around before it then gets received at some site. So by characterizing that multipath when it arrives at a receiver, you can learn a lot more information as well. So using for those first two, you use store and forward method, where if your receiver actually um, records what it hears, either on the baseband level or on the audio frequency level, it can then pass that on to the central processing station that then receives that information and does a lot more characterization based off of that. Um, active user calibration, we touched on that. We're using APRS um, folks that are driving around or any other, um, you can put up some known beacons like the HF beacon network as well. Um, frequency agile operation would be critical to make it useful for long-term deployment uh, for <coughs> single lo location or single disaster site or something. If everyone's using the same simplex frequency to talk or one repeater frequency, you could just have it locked on that. Um, but you do run into issues as well with mountaintop sites if you're near other high RF sources that it could seriously um, mess up things, which is why this needs to be a standalone system, um, which covers the solar power as well, so indefinite remote operation based off of that. Uh, for my developments this quarter, the specific thing is to make it run for at least a week at a time, either battery or solar system. That's pretty easy to do with power management nowadays. Making it more feasible for long-term deployment would require some sort of solar system or um, infrastructure-based power as well. Remote operation and control with uh, a lot of transceivers, you can remotely control them. It'd be great, change their frequency live, do different things with them. 
Um, and then eventually commercialization would be great if someone felt that this concept had a high enough value to actually commercially implement and make useful, um, that would be something that would be really nice. So that pretty much wraps it up. Um, any questions that we can touch on for you guys? Yeah, Terry. There's a, uh, <coughs> you said that the antennas had to be less than a wavelength, yeah. uh, a quarter wavelength apart. Is there an optimum space for the antennas? Can you repeat that? Right, so yeah, the question is um, for the pseudo-Doppler technique, the antenna spacing for that quad antenna array. Um, there's a decent amount of literature out that I recommend you read. The, um, Joe Mel's book has some good coverage of that. Um, it needs to be less than a quarter wavelength, typically, for it to work out well. Um, but if it's too close together, then you don't have a big enough difference to be able to discern a signal. So there's a trade-off between large and small rays. Um, this is an example of a Wi-Fi one in the top left that has really small antennas and they're really close to each other. Um, and that sort of system, yeah, I mean, obviously for different frequencies, you have different um, wavelengths or yeah, different physical sizes, of course. That should make sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I'm just curious if you guys consider integrating this into remote uh, weather stations, boss weather stations. Right. Since they're pretty much dropped in places and left and in any fire area, it would seem that this would be a, a good addition to that package. Right. That was actually one of the kind of fueling ideas as well as, you know, you can just have something that can be dropped off at some site. But actually integrating it in that would be ideal, actually. You'd already have that existing at multiple sites. And if they're remote configurable for changing frequencies, it'd be very useful. Yeah? The uh, package that you developed with the laptop and the uh, sound card yes. processor, uh, have you considered uh, seeing if the uh, you develop software that would do uh, multi-path elimination using the sound card? And so the question was for the sound card Doppler system using that software, is there multi-path elimination? Um, I haven't personally worked on any software development for that. Um, I believe there are some that exist that do that. Um, and they take in, you can, using that software actually, you can adjust um, the sample sizes as well and how much it's reading before it gives you a measurement. So at a basic level, yeah, it's doing some of that, but not actually looking at the signal's um, arrival. I've had some weird experiences. Somehow affect the, uh, the carrier. Right. So depending on the transceiver that's used, the one that I pulled up is uh, one of the Fairchild um, systems, and they, uh, sorry, Friendcom, the other FC, <laughs> um, they uh, have a small indication as well. So you could use that for the actual RF signals arrival, um, which would be a much better implementation. But in including, and that's all in development in the next couple weeks too. This is kind of that's the second half of the product that's happening in the next couple months. Let's go. Right, the squelch is one of the biggest factors there. So leaving the squelch wide open is great, but then at what point do you consider a threshold of, oh, this is enough to consider that was easy? From uh, some of the commercial outfits, also ham outfits, uh, a little Elver, ELT, and other signals, and because it looks like a little bit like that one on the right side. Right, that is a little Elver, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, then uh, the, I think it's the ham, I think his name was Harvey Osterweight, something like that. He was involved in CAP and ELT mining. Okay, yeah. So I definitely got some of my inspiration from my dad who's in Civil Air Patrol, and uh, ELT searching is one of them. Um, a number of the research systems, I didn't talk about this, one on the right is a little helper and it uses a time difference of arrival as well, but it's two antennas at one site, and it does a direct phase comparison between the two. You can build it, the handy finder is the common, commonly known one you might have heard of. Um, in the ham world. And uh, yeah, that sort of implementation was also considered um, for some received sites, and it's a little different than um, the other implementations. Any other questions? Do you know of any groups attempting this HF? There's interest amongst the, um, the X community to find the jammers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I'm not currently aware of any. Um, I know there are folks that are doing high frequency direction finding out there. Um, and the hobby for either of the two implementations I've done, not necessarily. Um, the Adcock setup that we saw at the very beginning where you have two different antenna sets, um, that's implemented in a few places that I'm aware of. Um, there are some that are integrated in the Apers network as well. And do you have, a, for example, an APRS enabled uh, repeater site. That repeater, when it receives that signal, it could easily be one of your um, nodes in the network as well. 
And by characterizing that and sends it out, says this is how strong I received it, you also know some things about the repeater site. It's an antenna pattern as well, what typically it receives different signals at. Um, and that's what the Seattle Radio um, Group is doing as well. So absolutely that would work. And if you had multiple receive sites around like the county or something, that would work beautifully. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. So thanks very much all for coming out. Hope you enjoyed the talk. Again, without other questions. Um, I can make a, um, a website, but I'll throw it up there. Yeah.